Welcome to the Intel Automotive podcast series. Today I'll be speaking with Sam Lamagna, Director of Advanced Driving Technologies in the Automotive Solutions Division at Intel around the need for open architectures in the industry. I'm your host, Brandon Wick. Welcome, Sam. Traditionally, the automotive industry has been based on closed proprietary systems. When thinking about solutions development on open architectures, what are some of the lessons to be learned from other industries? The lessons we can learn from other industries is how do we open this stuff up where we can attract new innovators? And how can we open this up to where those who've historically been in this have got the ability to create new capabilities and offerings? You know, we, we need to look at what are those means by which we can actually have something like a plug fest where you know, things are predefined, where folks from all kinds of different perspectives on how to do advanced driving technologies can show up and essentially load their capabilities or their views on how to do ADAS into standard hardware. You know, it can be configured and reconfigured really quite quickly. You know, that is the, the standard IT model here is open up as much as you possibly can on it so that you can drive kind of this bow wave of innovators. Those who aren't traditionally trapped into, we do things a certain way because they've always been done that way. It also opens up an amazing opportunity to better leverage academia. I mean, giving these guys open platforms, we do quite a bit with Stanford and Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and a few of the other universities where we say, here is your standard hardware platforms. Here's a framework by which we think uh, the software should be built. Go and innovate on top of it. And you know, the, the stuff they turn around and in the time frame they turn it around in absolutely astonishes us. So thinking about development from a compute-centric point of view, how is processing power changing the way systems designers are approaching advanced driver assistance systems, or ADAS? I think in the space of ADAS, there's, for lack of a better term, there's, there's soft ADAS and there's hard ADAS. And I think what a lot of the current bodies of work that are going on are looking at is how can we utilize the current platforms or current approaches to do things like soft ADAS where we can alert the driver of a situation and the driver can really make a determination as to whether or not uh, an action needs to be taken. But these typically aren't, I would say, mission critical type alerts, right? It's, hey, I'm backing up and I'm six inches from the curb as opposed to nine inches from the curb. That's a perfectly fine thing to do in an IVI system with a soft ADAS because there's, there's not a lot of hard safety required in that. And every time you add safety, there's, there's typically a, a cost adder, whether it's that cost be time or that cost actually be hard dollars or that cost be you know, incremental validation. But I think you know when you get to, to hard ADAS, you'd probably want to leave that in a, its own discrete box, right? So that's a, I'm backing up and there's a wagon behind my car. The car knows to apply the brakes, whether the driver puts the brakes on or not. Or the driver is becoming a bit lethargic and the car is starting to drift into another lane. The car brings you back to your lane safely. These are things that require an immense amount of CPU crunching and an immense amount of sensor fusion and an immense amount of safety. And you don't typically want to put that into an IVI unit. Sam, you mentioned ADAS. Tell us how this works and where it happens. Typically, what the ADAS system itself isn't the hard ADAS system itself, is not the one that is, I would say, communicating to the outside world or consuming data from the outside world. What would typically happen is the ADAS system will have a quality service relationship with the head unit and the head unit would typically act as the communications gateway to the outside world. So where will you do that, that analytics? Well, I think it's going to happen at the domain level within the car, whether it's you know, the transmission or the suspension or the, the steering. I think it's going to happen at the driver level, right, informing the driver as to what the driver should be doing differently or the car learning from the driver, taking driver's habits and analyzing them and creating a better driving experience. I think it's also going to happen at the roadside units, uh, the, the traffic signs, uh, other vehicles around it, and to some extent, of course, up in the cloud as well. The city planners start thinking about where's my traffic congestion, uh, what's my roadways look like, what's in need of repair, and where should we build out uh, the infrastructure a bit more. 
Sam, so anytime personal data is being collected and used, issues of security and privacy are obviously very important. Tell us about your team's work in this area. Security-wise, there's two sets of three things that I have my team looking at today. The first is, how do we make sure that if, you know, if we receive a piece of information, that it is actually a clean piece of information? Right? How do we analyze it and make sure that it's not corrupted or contains a Trojan or, or a worm in any, any way at all? The second is, if a piece of data comes in, how do I quarantine it? Right? Can I quarantine it? And if a bad piece of data comes in and it gets past the quarantine methodology, how do I make sure that if one of my mission critical elements in the car gets impacted, how can I gracefully bring that system to a state where I can safely get home, even if it, that system is not completely delivering on all the features that it was designed to. So to this one, you know, that last part is, I just got to get to the side of the road or I got to get home or I got to get to a shop in a safe way. I can live without my adaptive cruise control for, you know, for the next day. So it's, you know, is the data clean? Can I quarantine it? If I can't, how can I make sure my systems retain a, a baseline level of capabilities to safely get me where I need to be. Um, those are the first three. The, the other ones is maybe even at a higher level, it's how do I make sure that, that my data is safe and private when it's being stored somewhere, regardless of whether it's being stored in the car or the roadside unit or the cloud? How do I make sure it's safe and private as it's being transmitted, right? I may want to pull data from the cloud or a roadside unit, um, or I may want to push data out there. So how do I make sure it's safe as I transmit it? And then last is, how do I make sure it's private as I'm actually executing upon it? And how do I make sure that whatever gets executed upon it doesn't get into the wrong hands? So I'm perfectly fine with the town that I live in being able to take a bunch of anonymous data, just filter through it and say, there's a lot of traffic on these particular roads on these type of days. And you know what? Here's the average speed. That speed's slowed down over the years, but traffic density hasn't changed. Why? Well, maybe the road is in worse in condition. Let's get out there and take a look at it. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with the car knowing that, hey, maybe I'm heavy footed when I drive, or maybe I brake hard, or maybe I, I turn hard, and the car adapts and learns my driving style. I'm perfectly fine with that. What I'm not comfortable with is somebody taking that data and using it to model my driving habits for different commercial purposes that I didn't intend them to be, right? So having this data personalized and pointed back towards uh, insurance agencies or policing agencies or, you know, whatever that may be, um, that, that's not quite uh, very comfortable for anyone. So secured when I store it, secured when I transmit it, secured when I execute upon it. Sam, in terms of the data itself being produced in the automobile, a lot of people are wondering where it's going and who's going to have access to it. What are your thoughts on the state of the industry around these questions? Um, I have an opinion on it. Uh, I don't have the, the clear answers on it. I don't think anybody does. You know, from my viewpoint, I think ownership of that data is going to be spread across all those that you mentioned it even more. What I do as a driver most likely should be uh, retained in my ownership. How bumpy is the road as I drive down it? How active is my active suspension system? Uh, that's data that I should be, I believe, should be shared with city planners, right? So they can properly decide how are they going to build out their infrastructure. How does my car perform over time, right? Does it degrade? Does it need to get into a shop before there's a, you know, a serious failure? Are there things that perhaps are fine for a first generation automobile, but the car OEM wants to improve upon that for second to third generation. I see that's data that the, uh, the car OEM should have access to as well. So I don't know who's going to own all this data, but I think there's a, a very compelling argument that can be made that ownership is going to be spread across a whole lot of different entities and for, for good reason. Thank you, Sam. And thank you all for listening. Be sure to stay tuned for more podcasts in the Intel Automotive Podcast Series.